Everything ready? Wait, which one? Every, everything all right? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. The controllers. Let's just start and see what happens. Okay, so here we go. Dear Ajahn, is the 10 perceptions chant suitable for non buddhist who is sick? <laughs> which shall we chant for the non buddhist That's a kind of really good question. Um, you remember the, uh, the way... <laughs> <laughs> right, look, looking for the off button, but can't find it. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> so, um, so the question is, what sh what sort of chanting should we do for non-Buddhists? Uh, and uh, the um, the reason why these kind of chants, the way they work very often, they work because of the meaning. Yeah, the meaning is very important. Uh, and so ideally what we want to do is to transmit the meaning. That is why often it is useful to do like the Metta Sutta in English, uh, because when you do it in English, people will understand. Uh, so I would rather suggest something like the Metta Sutta, so they can understand the meaning of what is going on. Uh, that becomes very, very nice. But if you're going to start, if you're going to chant from someone from afar, from away, not in their presence, but from afar, of course, then it's more like a transmission of energy. It is not so much a transmission of meaning. So in that case, you can do any kind of chant. I think the most important thing then is the quality of your heart. Yeah, what is the quality of your heart? What are the, the vibes? What are, the, uh, what are you sending them in terms of a message, in terms of uh, energy? That is what, what is most important uh, so whatever inspires you, I would say, is the best thing to chant on those kind of occasions, yeah? Whether it is the Metta Sutta or the uh, Ojanga Parita or whatever it might be, is, uh, would be suitable. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and usually I always say that if you do chanting for somebody, you should let them know that you're doing chanting for them because uh, that has a placebo effect, yeah? If they know that you're doing something kind, they feel good. That often helps as well, yeah? So always let them know. So uh, that's, yeah, that's another factor there. All right. Here, Arjan, what was uh, done with the Buddha's body when he died? I have heard that the Arahant's bones turned to gems after death. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is interesting, right? Uh, so what was done uh, to the Buddha's body? So you want to know exactly what was done? Uh, you want to have the precise information, or do you want to have rough information? <laughs> I guess the precise, the, the best, the best uh, information we have on that is actually found in the suttas. It's found in the uh, Diganika, the long discourses of the Buddha, in the second chapter in the sutta called uh, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. That's where you find all the information on the Buddha's passing away. So let's forget about, should we have Pali? Uh, let's let's just go plain for now, no Pali. And then we go to the Buddha's uh, deathbed. Ding. Uh. So here we are. The Buddha's last words, right? We're getting very close now. Uh, the full extinguishment. So here we are. So can, can you see? You probably can't see. Can you? Wow, you have very good eyes. Okay. Let's just see. Now that now we can really see now. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, these were the Buddha's last words. And then what happened then? This is what happened. This is what happens when the Buddha passed away. So uh, I don't know if you're interested in all of it, this, but uh, first of all, the Buddha goes through all the kind of meditations, the first jhana, second jhana, fourth jhana, all the immaterial attainments. He goes to the cessation of perception of feeling, which is the kind of pinnacle of samadhi. And then... Uh, Venerable Ananda says to Venerable Anuruddha, he says, uh, the, has the Buddha become fully extinguished? Has he attained Parinibbana? No, says Anuruddha, because he has the divine eye, so he knows what's happening. And uh, so he's just attained the cessation of perception of feeling. Then the Buddha comes out of that. He goes down all the various uh, uh, deep meditations. And uh, then he goes... Up again, it goes to the fourth jhana, the other fourth jhana down here. He comes out of the fourth jhana and then immediately attains full extinction at that point. Yeah? So then what happens? Then uh, there was a great earthquake, first of all. And then you have the Brahma Sahampati with a verse. 
And this is the verse that the god Brahma Sahampati said when the Buddha passed away. It's kind of cool. Yeah, he said, all creatures in this world must lay down this bag of bones. That's your body, the bag of bones. For even a teacher such as this, unrivaled in the world, the realized one attained to power, the Buddha became fully extinguished. And then Sakka, the Lord of the Devas, he says a verse. Yeah? Anuruddha says a verse. Ah, this is a famous verse, Anuruddha says. Uh, no, it's not the famous verse, uh, sorry. This is the famous verse. It's from Sakka is the one who says the famous verse. Oh, conditions are impermanent. The nature is to rise or to arise and pass away. Having arisen, they cease. The stilling is true bliss. Anicca vatta sankara upadavaya dhammano upajitva nirujanti te sangvupasamo sukko. A very famous verse in Pali. Every funeral we go to, you will hear that verse. Well, maybe not everyone, but 90%. Anuruddha, another one. Uh, Ananda says a verse. And then you have, when the Buddha became fully extinguished, some of the mendicants there who were not free of desire, with arms raised, falling down like the feet were chopped off, rolling back and forth, lamenting too soon the Blessed One has become fully extinguished. Too soon the Holy One has become fully extinguished. Too soon the eye of the world has vanished. You fall on the ground, rolling back and forth. Can you see the monks doing that? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So. <laughs> yeah, you you hear about monks. You hear sometimes about strange stories about these things. Yeah, and of course you are you're a bit desperate. You're not. You haven't got to the end of the path yet, and the Buddha is gone. And of course you you uh, you forgot about impermanence. Yeah, you didn't contemplate impermanence enough. That's the reason. Yeah. But those mendicants who were free of desire, they said, conditions, they are phenomena are impermanent. How could it possibly be otherwise? Yeah. You have enough contemplation. Anyway, so then uh, all of various things happen. The deities are there and blah, blah, blah. I shouldn't say blah, blah, blah. That's really kind of a bad thing to say. <laughs> and then the, all the mallas of Kushinara, they come out. They pay respect to the Buddha. And everyone is kind of... And then we have the rites of venerating the Buddha's corpse. So they come out and they bow down to the Buddha, the fragrances. And then they want to cremate the corpse. Uh, so let's see what is going on. This, um, uh, uh, yeah. So the, so they don't. Call, yeah. Anyway, oops, go away. Huh? Yeah. So. Um, okay, the date is yeah. So, so all kind of things. There's lots of kind of little details about what happened after the Buddha died. And most of this, you can't read everything because we're going to be here all night. You want to be here all night? No, okay. <laughs> um, so how do we... So here we start. Yeah, so what should we do? How should we proceed when it comes to the realized one's corpse? Proceed in the same way as they do for a wheel-turning monarch. How shall we proceed with a wheel-turning monarch's corpse? They wrap a wheel-turning monarch's corpse in an unworn cloth. Then with uncarded cotton, they again, then again with unworn cloth. In this way, they wrap the corpse with 500 double layers. Then they place in an iron case filled with oil and close it up with another case. Then having built the funeral pyre out of all kinds of fragrant substances, they cremate the corpse. They build a monument for the wheel turning monarch at the crossroads. A monument is a stupa, right? That's the Pali word. Pali word is stupa. Sanskrit is stupa. Uh, that's how they proceed with the wheel turning monarch's corpse. Proceed in the same way with the Buddha's corpse. A monument for the realized one is to be built at the crossroads. When someone there lifts up garlands of fragrance or powder or boughs, or inspires confidence in the heart, that will be for their lasting welfare and happiness. This is one of the reasons when you go to India, you go to the various places of the Buddha to inspire confidence in the heart. 
Then the mullahs order their men, so then, my men, collect uncarded cotton. And then they wrap the Buddha's corpse, place it in an iron case filled with oil, and having built a funeral pyre, a funeral pyre is a big mound of, of wood, out of all kinds of fragrant substances, they lifted the corpse onto the pyre. And there's a story of Mahakasapa. Mahakasapa takes a while to show up. It takes seven days, uh, yeah. And then various things happen. Mm. That, uh, indeed, that's what they say, funeral cask. Maybe that was the case, the iron case they had in Patna Museum. Eh? They said the iron case. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so either. I think it's very unlikely. Yeah. So, then Venerable Maha Kasapa arrived at the Malian shrine named Coronation at Kusinara and approached the Buddha's funeral pyre, arranging his robes over one shoulder. Yeah, everything is always over one. This is what we do still in the present day. We follow the ancient tradition, raising his joint palms. He respectfully circled the Buddha three times, just like we do now. All of these things are ancient traditions going back at least two and a half thousand years. Some of them probably go back to before the time of the Buddha. Keeping the right side towards him, always the right side towards the Buddha. You bow with his head at the Buddha's feet, just like we do today. And 500 mendicants did likewise. And when the Mahakasapa and the 500 mendicants bowed, the Buddha's funeral pyre burst into flames all by itself. And when the Buddha's corpse was cremated, no ash or soot was found from the outer or inner skin, flesh, sinews, or synovial fluid. Only the relics remained. The word for relics is datu in Pali. Now, sarira it is here. Sorry, here it is sarira. But later word is datu. And so, for example, in Sri Lanka, you would know this, the famous uh, stupas in Sri Lanka. They're called dagabas. You heard about the dagabas? No? Okay, this is what they're called. The large stupas, and they're called dagabas. And the, the word dagaba means datu garba. It's a short form of datu garba. Datu is, a, is the uh, relics, and garba, or gabba, is a chamber. Yeah, so it's a chamber for relics. It's a relic chamber. That's what they, why they're called this, these large stupas in Sri Lanka. It is like when ghee or oil blaze and burn, that neither ashes nor soot are found. In the same way, when the Buddha's corpse was cremated, no ash or soot was found on the outer inner skin, flesh, sinews, or synovial fluid, fluid. Only relics remained. And of those 500 pairs of garment, only two were not burned, the innermost and the outermost. <laughs> so the, you can see here, it was getting, this is getting a bit sort of... Um, uh, <laughs> a little bit kind of uh, supernatural, isn't it? Uh, how can the innermost and outermost not burn? That's really kind of strange. And when the Buddha was consumed, court was consumed, the funeral pyre was extinguished by a stream of water that appeared in the sky. So probably devas were putting it out uh, by water dripping from the sal trees and by the mala's fragrant water. So probably the mala's fragrant water was the main one. And then people saw other things because they were a bit, uh, maybe because they were so sad, they would see anything they wanted to see at the time. Then the mallas made a cage of spears for the Buddha's relics in the town hall and surrounded it with a buttress of bows. For seven days, the honored, respected, revered, and venerated them with dance and song and music and garlands and fragrances. That's how they had funeral ceremonies in the old days, dance and song, music and garlands and fragrances. That was some funeral service. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. No kind of holding back. They really went for it. Uh, <laughs> these days, people cry. In those days, uh, they were dancing and singing. Uh, things have changed. Uh. <laughs> then comes the distribution of the relics. Uh, yeah, so that, then they, they distribute the relics into, uh, into eight cases. And this is how there was famous eight places in India that the relics were distributed to. So the king Adatusattu of Magala got one, the Mal Malas got one, so various tribes got one each, and the Sakyans, I think, got one. And so that is how the, the relics were distributed. So your question is, well, what kind of relics? Yeah, did they become gems or not? 
And this is actually a very interesting little question because very often we talk about relics of the Buddha and people have relics kind of on their shrine and sometimes they say they multiply and all these kind of things. So what exactly is going on there? Now in India, there was one place where these relics were uh, placed. Uh, that is, um, place is now called, uh, uh, this is the, I think this is the ancient capital of, uh, what, what was the place that was, uh, I can't remember now the exact details, one of the eight places. Now let's have a quick look at these eight places. Uh, uh, the Sakins of Kaplavatu got one, yeah, the Lichevis of Vesali got one, the Bullis of Alakappa, never heard of them before, but they got one, the Kolians of Ramagama got one, Brahmin Vedadipa got one, the Mallas of Pava got one. So what happened was that one of these, I can't remember exactly which one now, I think maybe the one for the Sakyans, uh, was put away in a stupa. And soon afterwards, that village or town where that stupa was went back into the jungle. Uh, and so that kind of, th that, those relics were the only ones that kind of got lost in the jungle. Uh, yeah, Piprava is the place called, I think, now in the present day. And then uh, an Englishman in India, his name was Pepe, he had kind of a big estate in India in this particular area. Uh, and he found this kind of mound in the forest. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mound in the forest, very interesting, right? What are these mounds in the forest? Usually there's something there. And so he dug out this mound in the forest, which turns out to be in that place. Is, it, it is thought where those, uh, one of these relics were placed at that time. And so he digs into this mound. Yeah, he makes a kind of trench across it. It's a very large, large mound. And he goes into this chamber. And he found, finds first one chamber, and it goes beyond. Below that one finds another chamber. And in that he finds an urn. And on that urn it is, it is inscribed the relics of the Buddha. Right? And that's kind of extraordinary. And that, because it is in the jungle, and because it has probably been lost for like over 2,000 years, that is most likely to be the most authentic Buddha relics in the world. And there are no Buddha relics that are more authentic than those ones. So they were then taken out, and this was deciphered by a very well-known German scholar called Harry Falk. He's a kind of specialist in ancient scripts and this kind of thing. So he could read these ancient Brahmi characters, and uh, you can read them yourself as well these days. And it seems to be basically saying, the, I can't remember the exact text now, but something like the relics of the Lord Buddha kept by the Sakyan clan or something like that is, is the inscription on this ancient urn. And so those urns were taken out. And then they eventually ended up in the museum in Delhi. And this is why we're going to Delhi Museum when we go to India, to have a look at those relics when we go there. So those of you who are coming with me, you get a chance to see those relics. So what do they look like? Interesting. What do they look like? Because normally we think of relics, they're supposed to look like gems, like you are saying here, right? Gems. But no, what is interesting, these relics look like bones. Isn't that kind of interesting here? So if the Buddha's relics look like bones, uh, what does that mean in terms of kind of what relics are supposed to look like? Uh, and I think the reason why many relics look like gems uh, is not because that means they are an arahant, just because they have, they kind of the bones turn into gems. Uh, they say that when you burn bones over a certain temperature, uh, then it crystallizes and it starts to look like gems. Uh, so I think the reason why many monks bones look like them because the fire is very, very hot. And because the fire is so hot, it comes out like little crystals, looks like little gems. That's the reason. Whereas the Buddha's fire probably wasn't that hot. Yeah? And that's why it looks like bones. Because I don't really think that just because you're an arahant, your bones turns into gems. That, to me, that sounds very strange. That doesn't make any sense to me. And so I, I'm a skeptical monk, you see. <laughs> so this is how I see this. So, uh, does that answer your question? That's a long story to answer a short question, uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Mm. Who would have seen? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> but I think those monks they weren't cremated, they were just drying out, right? That was different. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah, but he did. Yeah, but okay, but uh, hmm. but uh, he, he, they should they shouldn't have cremated him. That was the mistake. <laughs> so I left him in the glass <laughs> glass thing. Yeah. 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 Good question. So I don't. Yeah. Hmm. Alternative histories. What what was might have been possible? Okay, so sorry to take so much time for that little question, but uh, anyway, so that's kind of a bit, uh, different kind of dhamma. S say again. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Taken with in the gyms, and they still are there in some places. Yeah. And in India, we always, um, you know, burn people on fires. It's very hot fires. Yeah. Uh, but then it turns to ash. The bones also, you know, except yeah. for very thick ones, it's not that they turn into relics. So I'm not really very really convinced. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not really very really sure what happened because uh, that's a. Okay. It's been actually witnessed by people that those gems are there. Mm -hmm. so I'm not sure why Buddhas are still bones. Maybe he just wants to tell it, tell us that it's he's, he was a human like us. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I I read somewhere that was a South Co in South Korea they burned bones over a certain temperature. If it was over a certain temperature, they got uh, it crystallized. That's what I'm basing my my uh, thing on. It's actually apparently real burning of bones that turned to crystal over a certain temperature. I guess it depends a little bit how you treat it and how what you do with it. Uh, so maybe it's not kind of straightforward. Uh, depends a bit on condition cause. Depends on cause and conditions, right? Like everything else in the in the world, maybe. Yeah. And still dance in India when elderly people die because yeah. elderly people they suffer quite a lot. Yeah. So when anyone over ninety dies, yeah. and people do dance and song and you really? know, they, yes, okay. song or okay. sing around the funeral. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's really nice. Yeah. Okay, good. Then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. In India. Yeah, the same day. Is that right, Lena? Burn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the temple. He died. Yeah. And uh, he died. Mm. We found him about you know late morning. Mm. And in that evening, it's starting. You know, yeah. get him, but you know, clean him up and uh, put all the pie and everything and burn overnight. Okay. Why? Same day. Why is that? Why is that? Yeah. Why do they burn on the same day? Is that is there a reason? Is there a reason for that? It's or is it... their culture. I don't know. It's in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. So, so it doesn't kind of become smelly and disgusting here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it's something yeah. to do with yeah. the, you know, the uh, disease mm. or something. Yeah. Okay. All Maybe right. That's why they burned the Buddha right away. Oh, they didn't. They didn't burn the Buddha right away. That's the thing. Right. They Did didn't. They? No, it took seven days at least. Oh, uh, it took a long time, and I think that's why he went into. the those meditations, yeah. This is what I was. This is what, what I think is, those meditations are about. He goes into very deep samadhi, so that his body is preserved as a consequence. Just like you were saying, yeah, you dry out the body. I think a similar kind of thing with the Buddha. He uh, just to preserve the body more. Yeah? That's what I would. I think the reason for those samadhis is because uh, he knew that it would take a long time. Yeah, he knew that people would want to venerate him and all of these kind of things. So. It's just a guess, but uh, you know. All right, let's go on to the next one. Dear Ajahn, how do I know that I'm practicing right view? Sometimes I doubt, doubt, doubt myself that I'm deluding myself. What is the litmus test? Thank you. The litmus test is that you become a better person. The litmus test is that you uh, meditate better. The litmus test is that the, the noble eightfold path starts to happen. The litmus test is that you come back here every year. 
Yeah, because uh, <laughs> that's what you do if you have a right view. You practice more Dhamma. And so, uh, it, yeah, so the litmus test is just see what happens in your mind, yeah? See if you become a better person, you have more metta, more compassion, you become more peaceful, you have less defilements, all of these kind of things. This is what right view should lead to, to some extent. So, be, yeah. But you have a point. It is easy to delude your, oneself. Uh, you practice, some people just practice and practice, and they don't get anywhere because they're not really careful enough in judging whether it's working or not. But actually, it's a very good point you have there. I have to, it's, it is a good point. And it's good that you ask these kind of questions. It means that you are very likely to get somewhere if you keep asking those kind of questions because you're always checking on yourself, which is good. Um, being too, uh, too sure of oneself is always a bad sign. Then having that uh, humility is actually very, very useful. So keep on asking that question and keep on adjusting. And then uh, eventually, gradually, gradually, you will get there. I will be sharing the zombie story with my kids later because it's their cup of tea. <laughs> also, such stories makes their interest grow in learning the Dhamma. Yes, that's how to package the Dhamma to that's how to package the Dhamma to younger generations. The first question that they may ask is by taking the cloth from the dead body, it is tantamount to stealing. After all, that cloth technically belongs to the deceased, as it was given by the relatives. So how do I go about answering that question? I think the Buddha said that once you are dead, you don't have any ownership anymore. Yeah? Ownership stops at the moment you die. At that moment, uh, the, the ownership is gone. So uh, uh, the relatives, they get what they want. So the relatives take their inheritance. And what the relatives don't want, that is called pangsukula. That is... Uh, cloth from the dust heap, you can take it and it is yours if you like. Yeah. So it is, uh, ghosts have no ownership rights. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of the bottom line. <laughs> All right. Next one. Dear Ajahn, thank you for your gentle reminder to me and all parents that we need to love our children and also to give them love. Here is the tricky part. Yeah. Uh, to love them but not being overly attached to them. It's a default mechanism in all parents, Ajahn, to want what's best for our children. As such, on a daily basis, it's like walking on a tightrope, checking our actions, whether it's done out of love or it is due to attachment or our own ego. For example, uh, it's getting more challenging to get my kids to attend Sunday Dhamma school. Do I let it be, Ajahn, or force them or dangle a carrot to get them to attend? But Dhamma classes are good and beneficial for them. They refuse to attend because they do not see any benefit in the class, and it's total waste of their precious time. They can play more computer games or something, right? So computer games are a bit more important than Dhamma when you are a certain age. You don't, you don't say that I'm adding this, by the way. Yeah, so <laughs> so I, I would say allow, don't force them yeah, to these things. Suggest it. Try to tell them that this may, may be very useful for you down the track. Uh, try to make them understand that uh, uh, this, the meaning of life is more than computer games or, or whatever. Uh, um, but if they really don't want to, I would say not, don't force them. Uh, because uh, the Dhamma is something that often it takes a certain maturity to understand the Dhamma. Yeah, and sometimes we let our kids, uh, is it good for them or not? If it, if it, I think if we push them too hard, they may actually turn them off the Dhamma instead. It can have counter counterproductive effects. Uh, so I would say, you know, be gentle. If you, if you really don't want to go, darling, you don't have to go. Yeah, it's okay. You can uh, become, become stupid, sit here and become stupid with your videos. <laughs> no, don't, don't say that. Um, <laughs> just, uh, yeah. And uh, the time comes usually when you get to a certain age and you start to realize that life is more than the ordinary things in the world and you become more interested in the Dhamma, yeah. And that's what happened to me. I, you know, you get to a certain age and you think, wait a minute, I've got to use my life in a, in a wise way. Here. And uh, this is what happens to many people. To some people, it never happens to them. That's also okay. Here. Yeah, this is the thing. You, your children, they come into this world with a certain character, with a certain already from a past life. And so we can only do so much. And uh, that little thing, the most important thing we can do, as I said yesterday, that this research article pointed to, is to love our children. Uh, and I think then we're doing a lot already. So 
yeah, don't don't try to shape them too much, uh, and just uh, see what happens. Uh, yeah, and uh, usually they come out really well if you give them that uh, support, which is the uh, the love and these kind of things. So. Yes, please. That is another good question, right? Is the Dhamma school really done properly? Is it done in the best possible way? Yeah, that is actually a very good point, I think. So uh, who, who is in charge of Dhamma school, Bobby? Uh, at BGF? Uh, not here, okay. So this is something... Sorry? I did it, okay. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, <laughs> don't worry. No. So this, I think this is a very important point, is that you know, we should... Uh, Try to understand what the child, what is useful for our children, yeah? how they will, how they can relate to the Dhamma. These are really important points, uh, and I, I am certainly no expert. Uh, but uh, sometimes we become too traditional. We do things the traditional way because of the way it is always done. Uh, but don't be afraid of being more uh, uh, creative in how we teach the Dhamma. Yeah, think of new ways and think what is interesting to them and how they can learn better. Uh, and uh, I think this this is actually very uh, very important. Uh, Sometimes you can ask the kids, yeah, what, what you, you know, what is a, what would you like to hear about? What is interesting for you? Now, maybe, maybe you can make a video game with the Buddha. Yeah, maybe that's no shooting, of course, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Just that's a crazy idea. But anyway, you know, something like that. Uh, I know it's really hard to be a teacher, so I don't really, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult. Uh, so uh, anyway, best of luck. Dear Arjan, would you like to say anything, teacher? Do you have any comments on this? <laughs> no, no one said anything. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, no need to say anything. <clears throat> Dear Arjan, how do you energize yourself to teach nine days non stop? <laughs> I try to adopt healthy habits, e.g., um, leave enough rest, eat healthy, exercise, etc. But when I work, I often get lethargic quite uh, very quickly, even when I schedule in between breaks. How can I have more energy like you? <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, one of the things is that the kind of work that you do as a monk is energizing work. Yeah? Yeah? It is inspiring work. Yeah? And uh, when you are inspired, you tend to have energy. And this is one of those important things. Uh, and uh, but So this is one thing. The other thing is that when I kind of leave this room, I don't do very much afterwards. Uh, yeah, I try to minimize, maybe I answer a few emails because I have to keep on top of things uh, as well. Uh, but I try to chillax uh, and just rest a little bit when, I, when, I, when I'm not here. Yeah. And uh, so Venerable Punsirish invited me to go to the, an ordination ceremony today, which is very kind, and I wanted to do that. Uh, then I checked my energy level. I thought, no, it's the wrong time. I need to conserve my energy a little bit. So I, I apologize for not, not being able to going, but sometimes you just have to know your limits as well, eh? and then you withdraw. Eh? So this is kind of the difference, yeah? This is one of the reasons why it's useful to have a job that you enjoy, eh? that you feel inspired by, because it gives you more energy in that way. And if your job is not so inspiring, make it inspiring. Why? How? Well, by you know, adding Dhamma into your job, eh? by doing whatever you are doing, do it for the benefit of other people. Do it with this feeling that you are adding value to other people's lives. You're doing like no charity, generosity. Yeah. This is what I try to do when also when I teach. So whatever I do, really, I try to put that sense into it that I'm trying to help other people, yeah? And uh, if other people don't want to listen or whatever, actually, people usually listen, but even if they don't want to listen, okay, whatever, it doesn't really matter. I've done my best. I try to kind of help out. Yeah. So this is kind of having a Dhamma attitude to the things in life. That also energizes the mind, yeah. So, um, and then, of course, a bit of meditation, yeah, in, to kind of help out uh, as part of the chillaxing routine uh, and uh, all of these things. And together, you put together a mind that is energetic. Yeah. This is the, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh. <clears throat> Hello, Arjan. How to strike a balance between pursuing and contentment uh, in this worldly realm competition is inevitable. One definitely needs to keep upskilling uh, um, further, or far, upskilling something, which one will become 
failing which one will become redundant, I see. And to survive, we need to earn a living and to sustain that earning power. I foresee my children may stumble upon uh, those similes at MN54 and understand them in a different context. Given that it is so competitive and one is willing to hurt another to get that scrap of meat, there is no reason to strive harder because there will surely be many trying to pull them down. This would be the excuse to not put more effort in the studies, career, etc. Thanks, Ada. Um, so, uh, I, don't, I don't think there is any real, necessarily real um, contradiction between pursuing and... Con there is some contradiction, but not an absolute contradiction. Huh? And uh, the, uh, the trick about... Uh, Balancing this is to enjoy what you're doing again. Yeah, doing it for the right reason. Doing it because it's enjoyable. Doing it because you're adding value to the world. And then, even if you fail at your undertakings, it doesn't matter because you have built up spiritual qualities instead. This is the lesson from that Ajahn Brahm story about burning down of the monastery. Yeah, the monastery you burn down, you can just let go. Why? It doesn't matter whether the monastery was built or not, because you were developing spiritual qualities. And so this is kind of the trick, right? To, to Then you're always putting in something positive. And that means that you can be content with whatever. If you fail, you are content. If you succeed, you are content. Everything is okay in a sense because you're doing it for a different reason. That's the ideal. You never reach that ideal fully because it's very hard to reach that fully. But you reach it at least partly. Huh? And that is kind of the point here. Huh? So uh, again, yeah, you upskill. Why would you upskill? Because you, uh, you enjoy upskilling. Yeah, you learn learning something. Wow, that's great. I can learn something. Yeah. And then you, uh, when you enjoy your work and everything, then you also earn a living at the same time uh, while, um, uh, yeah, and sustaining that earning power, as you say. That's the theory. Of course, in reality, it is not always as easy as that. Uh, but you need to have a theory. You need to have an ideal to work towards. Uh, then you have some possibility of doing it. Many often the reality of work can be quite demanding. Yeah, not everyone is equally nice, not everyone is equally friendly. There's all kind of competition and things going on. Uh, this is the great thing with Ajahn Brahm. No competition, yeah, just uh, kindness all the time. It's kind of the monastic life is the best kind of work, that's what I reckon. Uh, and so you um, so this is kind of how you think about, try to think about it. Uh, and uh, uh, Sometimes, unfortunately, you have to make compromises uh, because sometimes if you, are, if you have it to earn a living, if you are dependent on that uh, money or that job or whatever, then of course, sometimes you have no choice but to compromise. And sometimes you have to bear up with a little bit of suffering because you are dependent on that job. Uh, but please don't bear up with too much suffering. Uh, if a particular job is really difficult and they, as they say these days, the work environment is toxic. Toxic is one of those favorite words. Everyone uses the word toxic these days. So if the work environment is toxic, then quit the toxicity. Yeah, Get out of it and move on to what is the opposite of toxicity? Kalyanamitasati. Kalyanamitasati or whatever it is. <laughs> and then you are on the, going to be on the right track. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so again, for your children, right? Uh, those similes don't mean that we shouldn't do things, but we should do things in the right way. Yeah? We should do things with uh, uh, ideally building up spiritual qualities. Uh, I don't know. I have some of the people that I know who are the most successful in the world, really, really successful people. Uh, uh, I know uh, one person, I, not a very close friend, but acquaintance from a university, uh, and he built up this company from scratch, and now it's a company that has offices in 30 countries around the world, a thousand employees, is the world leader in, the, uh, in a certain, uh, certain kinds of um, information in the oil sector. It's kind of incredibly successful. Uh, and this person, he's like one of the nicest people you can meet. Yeah, really, really friendly, really nice, uh, allows people to do what they think. He's a very happy person, uh, always content, really. Uh, and he's incredibly successful, uh, yeah. And so sometimes the people who are really kind are successful because they draw other people in. It, you know, who are the popular people in the world who really draw other people in? They are people with good qualities. 
someone like Ajahn Brahm, he has always a large entourage, a lot of people around him who want to talk to him and see him. If you read the suttas, the people who had a large group of people around them, people like Hattaka of Alavi, supposed to have 500 people always following him around. Why? Because he, he had the four, um, uh, the four uh, Sangaha Bhattus. Sangaha Bhattus are the qualities that draw people in. Yeah, Generosity, uh, helping people out, kind words and equal treatment. Uh, these are the four Sangaha Bhattus. And so the people who are kind are the ones who draw other people to them. Uh, and you get good talent coming to you, to your company. Uh, so I find that um, uh, kindness always works uh, and it pays off in the long run. Uh, Okay, so maybe there are some bad people in the corporate life as well. I'm sure there is, uh, but uh, sometimes there are some really good people. And I would recommend you to do the right thing. And I think chances are you will succeed if you are a good person in the work environment. Uh, other people will see you. Yeah, if you have a good leader, they will say, wow, this is a really good person. Other people will not be afraid of you. Uh, yeah, you, they, they will feel as if you're not a competitor because you are a kind person. And sometimes those people who don't compete, that no one is afraid of, they often rise to the surface because no one is afraid of them. I don't know. Something like that. So, um, yeah. We just have to do your best, I suppose. And there, it's kind of difficult for me to give um, good advice on how to raise children. I, you know, it's not kind of my forte to raising children. So... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, as I clear, I realize the time is going very fast. So maybe we'll just finish off with a little bit of meditation before we call the day, call the day out.